Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, probably another aspect with regard to vaccine effectiveness, and that's ultimately the immune response that you're inducing and what can regulate that. Obviously, when you're looking at any kind of a vaccine approach, it's the quality as well as the quantity that you want to elicit. And then obviously it's a contingent also on the viral model that you're trying to actually induce a response to. As we learn more and more uh, from Nikolai's talk yesterday, as well as others, the adjuvant is a key component to eliciting a response. But also, um, you know, as an immunologist, we're interested in what can contribute to that. So my laboratory has been very interested in looking at natural killer cells as another innate pathway to further activate and more importantly regulate an immune response and more importantly adaptive immune response. And I'm going to talk about that. And this is also similar to that Nature paper by uh, Ray Welsh and Steve Wagoner last year looking at how NK cells actually downmodulated T cells. So as an immunologist, we're realizing that the more we try to turn something on, sometimes it tries to turn it off. And this has actually been very evident in cancer therapy. And what I'm going to do is talk about some of our work looking at NK cells and T cells. So what are NK cells? Well, they've been known for many, many years, since the 1960s and 70s. And for the most part, they're considered uh, in members of the innate immune system. They are pretty much were considered, for the most part, large granular lymphocytes and homogeneous, but known markedly for their immediate anti-tumor and antiviral activity. And they represent a relatively smaller component of peripheral blood lymphocytes. But what we're appreciating, rather than what they were called natural killer cells because they kill targets in virally infected cells, we also know they make a plethora of cytokines, a large amount of cytokines. And this may actually be really what they are meant to do, is actually modulate immune responses. Because these cytokines can range from immunosuppressive cytokines to immune potentiating cytokines. And so the question is why? Classically, what NK cells are shown to do is they kill. They kill virally infected cells. They're a good cell to have if you have any kind of viral infection, and they're a good cell to have if you have cancer. Uh, the question is, are they capable of other pathways? And it's known that they can do it directly, but also by antibody-dependent cytotoxicity, as well as by cytokines. And more importantly, and this is actually by the Karolinska Institute, I noticed we had uh, some people from them by Klaus Kare and uh, Hans Gustav Lundgren, they do this by recognizing what we call missing self, but also by the presence of stress ligands. And these are on virally infected cells and on tumor cells. And more importantly too, NK cells can recognize via class one, MHC class one. That seems to be the recognition uh, mechanism that NK cells use. Now, when we look at NK cells and T cells, if you looked at your classical immunology that you were taught by Janeway as well as others, there's a fine line between separating them. But what we know now is that there's actually a lot of, when we think of the definition of NK cells and T cells, whoops, we can see that T cells elicit antigen-specific memory, they need priming, and they're long-lived and tissue resident. This is your classical T cell response, your adaptive response. This is what we want to induce by a vaccine. And K cells, on the other hand, from the classical paradigm with regard to the innate pathway, you don't need priming. There is uh, inherently in the blood system. And what we also know, in humans at least, there's a huge component of NK cells in the lymph node as opposed to other species. It's actually fascinating when you look at the differences between mouse and man and K cells, there's more divergence between mouse and man as far as natural killer cells than T cells, suggesting that evolutionarily the NK cells are still developing and what we're finding is that maybe NK cells play, primarily play a role in immune homeostasis. What we know now too is that NK cells exist as subsets. In everybody right now, NK cells are not homogeneous. There are subsets of NK cells, just like T helper T, uh, and different T cell subsets, and they're based on the recognition of MHC, and in the human they're called KIRs, or in the mouse it's LY49, and these can be both inhibitory and activating receptors. These receptor systems are critical in allowing the NK cell to, de to determine friend from foe, but they also may be important in determining immune function. 
Now, there's some really key papers, the Nature paper I alluded to, but also other papers showing that NK cells can actually regulate adaptive immune responses. NK cells can regulate B cells and T cells both directly, as demonstrated by the Wagner paper in Nature, but also by modulating dendritic cells. And so what we're finding now is that NK cells in the immune synapse that everybody talks about where you have the dendritic cell, it presents the antigen to the T cell, that helps the B cell, and that modulates a response both from a primary and secondary. The NK cells seem to be playing a role in amplifying this, in controlling it, either by suppressing it or activating it. So the real role of NK cells may be actually immune modulation, not so much just killing. And it can do this because they make TGF-beta, IL-10, and they can make pro-inflammatory cytokines. So what we're finding is that these NK cells may be critical adaptive regulators for immune function. And more importantly, this has been shown to correlate with regard to even anti-tumor responses. There was a nice paper by Laurent uh, Zivogel in Nature Medicine showing that different NK cell receptors seem to actually have different immunoregulatory functions, and this had outcome effects in cancer. And so what we're finding is that NK cells may be a nice prognostic indicator, and even if for vaccine responses in HIV, it's also been shown by Marion Carrington, uh, at the NCI, NK cells seem to play a critical role in modulating viral responses. Why? Well, we know at least they're important because viruses like CMV have actually pirated M uh, MHC-like domains to actually downregulate NK cells. And so the virus knows it's important and it's actually looking to suppress. So what we were interested in is looking at what we would call licensing. In other words, we know that there are NK cell subsets. What do they do? Can we discern their function? For the most part, most people have looked at whole populations of NK cells. We actually are looking at NK cells. In this case, we're using the mouse, looking at different MHC receptor binding proteins, this case LY49, that see self and therefore become licensed. Licensing is now a concept that's analogous to T cell education in the thymus or thymic education. Licensing with NK cells, Wayne Yokoyama published it in Nature, uh, suggests that NK cells that see the appropriate MHC then can become activated to a quicker extent. Primarily, this has been dictated by in vitro activities. We're now looking at it in vivo. So we want to know, can NK cells modulate T cell responses? It's actually been shown to already to play a role primarily by looking at depleting whole NK cell populations. We can, people have published that NK cells can modulate viral responses. They can actually modulate also T cell responses by DCs. And primarily the mouse models that people use are MCMV. It's been a nice model because you can use tetramers to actually modulate antigen specific responses. We also can use influenza in the mouse model using tetramers as well. And then also it's been shown that NK cells can limit T cell responses. This was a very nice paper by uh, Mark Smith and others looking at an MCMV as well, that's showing that NK cells have a dual role. They can both enhance or inhibit. And this is looking at whole populations. So obviously this is an important cell population to look. And so what we're trying to do is to see whether the NK cell role can be looked at by looking at subsets. NK cell subsets may be analogous, like I mentioned before, to T cell subsets, and that's what we're trying to do. And the important concept is that NK cells are now your rheostat. These are the cells that are going to amplify whether you give any kind of infection or any kind of antiviral response and can both up and down regulate. So our hypothesis is that NK cell subsets exist and they can have a unique functional roles and this is based on licensing and can affect the kinetics. And that the licensed population we're going to show is the effector suppressor population analogous to a T effector suppressor cell. And then the unlicensed population is what we're going to say is the helper population. And we can distinguish this based on the uh, cytokines that they produce. So the whole concept, I'm not going to go into great detail, is by using the immunogenetics and understanding what these cells bind based on MHC, the licensed and the unlicensed populations that we all have, and we're going to show uh, basically effects in people as well, can actually modulate adaptive T cell responses. Our schema is very simple. We're going to deplete the different subsets based on antibodies into mice. We're going to infect them with MCMV. And then we're going to look at readouts based on viral burden. But more importantly, look at the different antigen specific uh, by tetramer T cells, as well as dendritic cell effects. 
And what we find is very interesting when simply by depleting an appropriate NK subset based on LY49, this is your control, and looking at draining lymph nodes after, in this case, MCMV infection, we see the same thing with influenza that we can see that if we deplete one subset, in this case we deplete the helper subset, we see a marked decrease in our dendritic cells. This is gated on CD11C and looking at CD86 as far as co-stimulatory uh, molecules. We see we see a marked decrease in our dendritic cell population. Conversely, if we deplete the NK suppressor subset, we see an increase. So just by depleting an NK cell subset, we can see a differential effect on our dendritic cell population after viral infection, suggesting that the NK cells now can be distinguished. If we use total NK cells, we'll miss it, but by now looking at the subsets, we can actually see a differential effect on outcome. Most importantly, too, this correlates with tetramer or antigen-specific T-cell responses. That is, if we remove the helper subset, we see a mark, and this is looking at CD4 tetramers versus CD8 tetramers, that's antigen-specific for the virus. We can see a marked decrease in tetramer-positive T-cells as a result after infection, simply by looking at different time points, and when we remove the suppressor subset, we see a marked increase in our tetramer-positive populations. This is showing that the NK cells, based on subsets and licensing, we can now distinguish the uh, NK helper, NK suppressors, not only in dendritic cell outcome, but also in tetramer and antigen-specific outcome. More importantly, too, when we start looking at the mechanism, we find that this can correlate with the cytokines they produce. We find that the NK helper cells make more GMCSF than the suppressor cells when we, and by isolating them in the lymph nodes. Conversely, the effective suppressor cells make more interferon versus the helper suppressor cells. And what we're finding, this is even more correlated even with IL-10. What this tells us is that the interferon to GMCSF ratios correlate with function. The NK helper cells make GMCSF. This correlates with the increased dendritic cells that we're seeing in the lymph nodes and then culminating with increased tetramer responses. The NK effector suppressors make more interferon gamma in response to the virus compared to GMCSF, and this can therefore correlate with the function as far as innate effectors. So what we're proposing is that the NK helpers are actually adapting or promoting adaptive responses via dendritic cells, whereas the NK suppressors effectors are actually promoting more the direct effects, and this is based on interferon. In, co in collaboration with our colleagues at UCSF and Jeff Enstrom, we then looked in human NK cells, and with the typing, because of the bone marrow transplant facility that they have at UCSF, they could actually differentiate human NK cells based on license, based on their cure haplotype, and what they found was that the exact same paradigm existed that we saw in mouse. Inasmuch as when we look at the GMCSF to interferon ratio, it was the licensed cells that actually, and therefore the suppressor cells, made more interferon, and more importantly, the unlicensed NK cells in humans made more GMCSF, similar to what we saw in the mouse. So what we're finding is, regardless of the species, the NK helpers correlate with more GMCSF, and the NK suppressors make more interferon gamma, suggesting that this, therefore, could also correlate with function during any kind of viral infection and be an amplifier with regard to any kind of uh, T cell response. So then we did a re-challenge. Basically, what we did was we depleted the mice, and this time we're using influenza as a model. We're giving mice flu, and we're depleting the subsets. And then after 21 days, we do a rechallenge with the flu. But basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to correlate the tetramer or the antigen-specific T cell responses that we're seeing with outcome. And in this case, we're actually looking in this time as survival as a readout. And what we find is we find a, a correlation in as much as when we depleted the NK helper cells, we found that the mice upon rechallenge died. So therefore, what we're seeing as far as with less tetramers, uh, as far as indicating of antigen-specific T cells, we're also seeing less protection upon rechallenge. Importantly, when we see the uh, NK suppressors depleted, we do not see this decrease in survival, therefore correlating again with increased survival with increased tetramers. 
So what we're finding is that the NK helper cells are actually critical in maintaining an, an adaptive T cell response, and this actually correlates with upon secondary challenge. And so as far as a schema, what we're basically finding is that the NK effector cells actually go to the sites of infection. These are the cells that actually mediate what we call your innate resistance, and this is correlated with interferon production. Your NK effector cells or N licensed NK cells go to the sites, in the liver would be for a CMV, in the lung for uh, flu. We find them at the sites, and they actually mediate innate resistance to the virus. However, the unlicensed NK cells go to the lymph nodes. And the unlicensed NK cells are your NK helper cells. And what we find that these cells make GMCSF correlating with increased dendritic cell formation and then also correlating with a later increased adaptive T cell response as evidenced by increased tetramers both by CD4 and CD8 and also increased with increased survival upon rechallenge. And so what we're finding is that these dual role of NK cells may give us a handle on what kind of response we want to initiate whenever we do a vaccine or whenever we want to do a viral challenge. Further adding to this mix is the recent observations by Louis Lanier at UCSF suggesting that NK cells can exhibit what we call classically memory. And these memory NK cells may also be of use in inducing a response for long-lived antiviral effects outside of even the T cells. So in other words, when we start to look at now the mix that we're seeing as far as an antibody response or a T cell response, NK cells might have to be now considered as a critical component that we have to look at, and more importantly, maybe a nice biomarker looking for increased responses indicating a Th1, Th2 antibody versus T cell effects. So our conclusion from this is that licensing can serve as a marker indicating functional subsets of NK cells. It's ironic that NK cells have been discovered since the 1960s and 70s, and only now we're starting to understand that they're almost as complex, if not more complex, as T cells with regard to subsets. And by understanding these subsets, we may get a better handle on fine-tuning an immune response, an adaptive response. They may represent the critical link, linking innate and adaptive, and because now we have memory NK cells, they may actually be a better target for actually modulating a response. The licensed NK cells serve as the effective suppressor cells. They're the first ones at the site of infection, and they, they seem to be actually clearing the virus. And, but they may actually also inhibit T cells later on, which I don't have time to go into, indicating a suppressor function. The unlicensed NK cells act as NK helper cells. These NK helper cells, and we have now data when we can just purify these cells and adoptively transfer them, we actually boost T cell responses. So these may be actually a better adjuvant than, say, just giving a toll agonist, because the NK cells, while they can respond, may actually limit some of the inflammatory deleterious aspects of an adjuvant. But these unlicensed NK cells act as uh, uh, helper cells because they make at least GMCSF. We also know they exhibit other chemokine receptors and other cytokines, and they actually promote dendritic cell expansion in the lymph node early in both influenza and in MCMV. And this results in increased antigen-specific T cell responses. The cytokine production that we observe in differential both in mouse and human indicate that these may be nice biomarkers indicating the differential effects that they can do, but more importantly, it does correlate with the functional differences that we see. I don't have time to go into it, but if we actually use antibodies to block GMCSF from these NK helpers, we lose the dendritic cell expansion that we see, indicating that GMCSF is at least a major indicator for the dendritic cell activation and expansion correlating with the uh, tetramer responses. So therefore, NK cells can act as potential vaccine adjuvants, and that if we understand these subsets, we can actually follow them and use them in viral vaccines to modulate the T cell responses, and we can modulate also the innate responses when we look at viral infections as well. And I'd like to thank the laboratory as well as the different labs that we've collaborated with this, uh, in these projects. Thank you. <laughs> very, very nice presentation. Uh, really interesting to hear more about NK cells. With respect to intradermal delivery, there mm -hmm. are resident dendritic cells, there are Langerhans cells, dermal dendritic cells 
that are thought to capture antigen first. Right. What, what do you think the role could be or is for NK cells in the case of intradermal delivery or insult to the skin? That's actually a good question because we're actually trying some of those models in melanoma treatment as a matter of fact. NK cells are primarily going to be in the peripheral blood. And so you're not going to see them unless there's injury at the site for the most part. So usually what we're trying to get a feel for are we creating too artificial a system by forcing them in the dendritic, uh, um, in the dermal application without a large injury state. So in the, in the cancer scenario, it's a lot easier because then you're dealing with a very leaky vasculature, so you can do that. In a vaccine model, I think it's going to be probably a little trickier to apply that. And I think by understanding it, though, it may be that we might have to look at a nodal injection to actually see greater modulation. And I think that's probably going to be, from a vaccine standpoint, your greater chance, unless you're going to give it with a classic vaccine adjuvant and you're looking at it then to amplify. I think as a standalone, it might be problematic. Great, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much.